Hi, and welcome back to the wonderful world of the scientific hypothesis. My name is Brad Alger, and in this video, I'd like to introduce the ideas of John Platt, who was a philosophically minded scientist, actually he was a biochemist, who developed a program that he called Strong Inference that has much in common with the program of Karl Popper, the philosopher, that we've mainly been talking about. However, Platt added some key ideas that expand on Popper's general plan, most notably in the notion that we need multiple hypotheses to account for a given phenomenon. The fact that Platt was a working scientist, or had been a working scientist, lends his program valuable practical dimensions that supplement Popper's philosophical arguments. And assimilating Platt's ideas can improve the conduct of science as well as contributing to a better sense of the overall process of the scientific endeavor. So let's look into some of these new and useful elements of John Platt's programs. And as I've mentioned, they involve multiple hypotheses, eliminating alternative hypotheses, and repeating the process. Now, just to give them some names, not that it's that important to us, but Popper referred to his program as conjectures and refutations, whereas Platt called his strong inference. But that's just for historical background. The core of Popper's program, as we've said several times, are basically to observe, hypothesize, to explain some observations, predict and test severely, trying to falsify the hypothesis if possible and corroborating it otherwise. Now, Platt added three new elements which weren't really ignored by uh, Popper, but weren't emphasized by him at all, and yet they were the central parts of Platt's ideas. Platt says we should propose and test multiple hypotheses for the same phenomenon. We should try to eliminate all but one, and we should repeat the cycle, and this is what I'm referring to as the iterative nature of science. As an illustration, let's return again to the problem of the dead fish in the lake. Now you recall that the first hypothesis we had to explain this phenomenon was that acid rain caused by industrial air pollution was responsible. Now, many people, when asked to generate multiple hypotheses, will actually generate multiple predictions or multiple tests of the hypothesis that they already have. But if you recall the definitions of hypothesis and predictions that we've talked about, you can see that what's wanted is an entirely new kind of explanation for the phenomenon, not just new predictions from the explanation that we already have. So in this case, for example, a new hypothesis might be that there's a lack of oxygen in the lake water caused by algae blooms. Another hypothesis might be that parasites in the water attack the fish nervous systems and are killing them that way. Another hypothesis might be that chemical toxins coming into the groundwater from nearby oil drilling operations are killing the fish, and so on. These are all entirely different kinds of explanation, and they call for different tests. For example, hypothesis 2 predicts that there should be a lack of oxygen in the water, that there should be a lot of algae in the water, and that furthermore, if the level of algae is decreased, the health of the fish should improve. And this is clearly then a completely different explanation for the problem of the poor fish. And it indicates that we have to do entirely different kinds of tests to evaluate the hypothesis. There are, of course, many advantages to having multiple hypotheses. Maybe the most obvious one is that it helps prevent becoming too wedded to, too committed to any one hypothesis. And this helps reduce bias towards it. After all, if you have a number of hypotheses, you can take a much more objective point of view towards each one of them. I think it's equally important, however, that the action of generating multiple hypotheses requires you to think quite deeply about the problem, and in so doing, you may come to have a better understanding of what the problem is, as well as better ways of testing it, and this in turn helps you design better experiments as you try to eliminate alternatives. An ideal sort of experiment, for example, might corroborate one hypothesis while at the same time eliminating one or more alternatives. It's something that we'll return to later, as I've mentioned, but this process of having multiple hypotheses also increases one's appreciation for certain forms of negative data. And finally, 
Even though it doesn't guarantee that you're getting closer to the truth, corroborated hypotheses do lead to greater confidence if you have had a number of hypotheses and the one that you're left with has survived the test that you put forward, whereas the others have been eliminated. And since we are required to take action based on incomplete information, this is a particularly solid kind of incomplete information. Now, if we look at the big science machine again, it's testing our hypotheses, sorting them into the bins we've seen many times. This is the fundamental idea of Popper's program. Platt emphasizes this arm over here. Even when we have our falsified and non-falsified hypotheses, we're never completely done. There will always be an opportunity to generate new hypotheses to explain the old data, perhaps in a better way, as well as to generate new tests for the hypotheses that we've already tested. And this notion of the cyclical or iterative nature of science has a number of advantages of its own. It fosters a realistic view of scientific knowledge. We're less likely to see it as a collection of cut and dried facts that we just have to memorize, but rather as an organic process of developing and constantly testing our knowledge to see whether it is continually corroborated and stands the test of time or whether it needs to be replaced and revised. The Realization of that science is cyclical encourages revisiting incompletely answered questions. And any scientist can tell you there are all sorts of things that have passed by that we don't really have full answers to. When you realize that science is cyclical, then you're more likely to go back and consider these questions in greater detail. And finally, the iterative nature of science provides opportunities to retest old hypotheses as new experimental methods become available. Thanks for watching. Remember to give it a thumbs up if you like it and subscribe to hear more. See you next time.